All right. Well, we've got Mr. James Golden joining us today. You might He's know here. Uh, Bo Snurdly. And James, mm-hmm. where did that name ever come from? Um, so there were other Snurdlies on the Russian Limbaugh program, but nobody remembers me because I've been there for almost 31 years. So, um, And the first day that I started there, Rush asked me to pick uh, what Snurdly I wanted to be. I had no clue. I was rushing. I was in his studio at the moment at uh, WABC in New York. I looked on his desk. The Daily News was there, back page, sports page, some story about some guy, Bo Jackson, something. So I quickly said Bo, and had I known that 30 years later people would still be calling me Bo, I think I would have picked up another newspaper. <laughs> Bo Jackson was incredible, though, at that time. Yeah, he was. Is that when he was playing both football and baseball? That's exactly right. So, yeah, I'm just kidding. It was it was. A- hey, at least it wasn't OJ, right? And as I said, everybody else, there there have been other snurvies, but you know. There was Mervyn Snurdly, and there was another one. I forgot it myself. And where did Snurdly come from? That was just a weird name that Rush made up himself? That was just his name for whoever was um, screening the calls. They were a Snurdly. They were part of the Snurdly family. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) But the other Snurdlies must have been pretty short-lived. If you've been there 31 years, that's almost the entire length of the program, no? Uh, yeah, I mean, the others were very short-lived, as I said. No one remembers them. I came six radio stations, which was very near the beginning. And, uh, you know, and then it was, uh, the rest of it has almost been a blur. It's gone by so quickly. It's hard for me to believe so much time has passed. Well, and now everything's in slow motion. Not for me. Right. Your life hasn't really changed all that much, right? I mean, you know, this virus hasn't slowed us, slowed me down. The news cycle is still the news cycle, and it's it's hard to try to keep up with everything. I mean, that's the thing. If you try to step back and pretend that this isn't the country we're living in and the world we're living in right now, it's it's actually a pretty good time to be a content provider because there's never – a dull moment you you don't run out of things to talk about ever ever i mean and who would think that the democrat presidential nomination today would would actually be resolved and that's the b story you know (laughs) so a bernie drops out and it's like okay let's give that three minutes and then let's get back to talking about corona (laughs) you know so that's where we are but your day to day hasn't changed. So is it weird to kind of think about what everybody else is dealing with? Like it's such a foreign concept. Run that by me again. Just saying, you're go- for the first two weeks of this whole thing, I was still going into the office every day. And we're still yeah, up in yeah. manufacturing, but I'm working from home now. So the only thing I was joking, the only thing that changed for me in the very beginning was that my coworkers, we now stood in each other's doorways instead of walking into each other's offices. And I was saying no touching quite a bit. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Well, <laughs> and, and see, my life hasn't changed all that much because I'm still going into the studio. And um, it's except the traffic is so much easier because everything <laughs> is shut down. And, right. But aside from that, you know, the days are pretty much the same. They're, they're still the same hours trying to keep up with the news. Are you man? What are you, have they uh, have you switched it all from what you're manufacturing because of this? Or are you still just doing the manufacturing of the same products? Same products, same customers. So we deal with a lot of food and pharma people. So they're going strong. You know, we need them to stay open. We need a lot more than than that to stay open. That and and you know this this yeah. be a wake up call that we cannot depend on China to be the supply line for America. American manufacturing, which was already back on the upswing, 
we have got to do all that we can as a nation to make it easier for people to manufacture here. And I don't know what that entails. You would have a better idea than I would of what it's going to take to make manufacturing easier for more American companies to bring that business back home. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is the regulatory burden that's involved. You know, you never know which one of the agencies is going to knock on your door and demand to come in and what little infraction they're going to find because that's their job and they want to slap fines on you and that fun thing. And I was thinking about that earlier today. I don't know if you've you've probably seen the stories because you're responsible for one of the infamous stacks of stuff, are you not? I do. I submit my stack of stuff. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you have one of the most active Twitter feeds. It's like, how did, how fast do you read, James? A lot and fast. But um, yeah. <clears throat> so what I do, my little trick on Twitter is that I read a lot of stuff first, and then I can rapid fire post it. And I decide, eh, I'm not going to put that one up and, or whatever. But so I have a pretty good idea of um, of I cover a lot as you know, a day in terms of reading. I know. So I was wondering, have you seen the stories? I know Cuomo had come out yesterday or the day before he tweeted that he was going to be imposing fines for people that are violating social distancing rules of anywhere between 500 and 1,000 bucks. Yeah, good luck with that. Well, here's here's what's going on right now. Florida, you you have a sales tax, right, on everything but food? We do have a sales tax. I'm not sure whether it's on everything but food because I think um, on certain times of the year, they give it a break for like back to school stuff, clothing and all that stuff. But so right now, people are only shopping ma- mainly for food and might, they might be buying some stuff on Amazon. So there's a trickle of sales tax coming into the state. The state's not collecting much in the way of gas tax. They're not sending out those regulators that I was just talking about to enforce their silly rules and give out fines. Restaurants aren't getting fines. So they have no revenue. There's no DUIs. There's no speeding tickets. So they've got to make up this kind of stuff and start ticketing people for these minor infractions. And yes, on one of um, yeah, on one of his on one of his um extended um campaign <laughs> Cuomo. Yes, I shouldn't say that because, well, on one of his news conferences, he was demanding that the federal government provide a bailout to the states because the states have lost so much revenue by this shutdown that it's going to be hard <laughs> for them. And what his argument was uh, was that in order for businesses to come back thoroughly the state governments have to actually be up and running too, that the two were conjoined. You couldn't have one without the other. And so it was a necessity for the feds to bail out the states, in fact, bail out the states first so that they could help these businesses get back on their feet. So we need another person in the middle of that transaction? It can't just go federal government straight to the people. It's got to go through Cuomo's office so they can take a cut? Yeah, got to go, yeah. It has to get their beak wet too. They all, everybody's got to get their beak wet. So states have to get their beak wet in order for businesses to reopen. When he was saying it, I, I was saying to myself, "This doesn't make sense. There's no way that that we need a federal bailout for states in order for a business to reopen. That just doesn't make logical sense." But that was the way he was positioning it. Well, he's seeing everybody else getting a bailout, and he's saying, gimme, gimme, gimme. Exactly. Well, exactly. Let me ask you, let me ask you this, James. Uh, you know, you're in Florida. Uh, Governor Ron DeSantis has been criticized for his response, uh, g- being kind of slow in regards to putting a stay-in-place order. Uh, how do you feel he's been doing on the job with the coronavirus response? I think Ron DeSantis has been doing great. Look, everybody expects that there's this cookie cutter that everyone's supposed to fall into. Oh, there's a stay in place order in this place. Florida must need one too. Well, no, Florida didn't need a stay in place order. Now, I will say that I thought the kids that were on the beach were being a little bit reckless with the spring break stuff, but a lot of the businesses that supported that were already closed. 
so they were on the beach having their fun, and yeah, that was a little reckless, but they're kids, and kids do reckless things. <laughs> there were a group of them that were partying in Tampa, and out of that group, some of them came down with the coronavirus. But you know what? Most, if not all of them, are, are going to recover. There have been deaths in some of the lower age ranges, but not nearly as much as the older adults. There's also a mentality that you want people, younger people, to actually contract the disease in numbers so that they can build up what I'm sure we've all heard this phrase now, herd immunity, so that the society can start to immunize itself from the spread. So I don't know whether even keeping the beaches open as long as he did was ultimately a bad call. I don't think it was. I don't. I think the governor down here has been doing a great job. But the mainstream, <clears throat> the press in Florida is no different than the press in Washington D.C. No different than the press in L.A. No different than the press in San Francisco. If there's a Republican, they are going to trash him, especially in battleground states. Every red state so that they can weaken Trump's chances for re-election. Part of this has been political from day one, and anybody that's an astute political observer can see the politics that has been inside the news coverage of this crisis from the first day it made front page news. And you'll have to remind me, James, how early on in this whole thing was did you, did Rush start talking about the virus? Was it as far back as January when some other people started raising it? I don't believe it was January. I think in January most of the nation was consumed on the impeachment. Mm -hmm. That's what was consuming the headlines. So yeah, there were some people talking about it. I have some friends that are musicians that were doing that were traveling, um, and one of the places they had to travel was. Um, that was routed on their, their schedule was Beijing. He routed it to take them out of Beijing because they were aware of it. But they were aware of it because the concert promoters over in Asia were already dealing with the ramifications of it. So there have been people that were aware that there was a problem. I understand that some of the intelligence communities uh, knew that this could be a problem early on, but the nation was not riveted by coronavirus. We were riveted by impeachment. Mm -hmm. I, this isn't our first pandemic either. This isn't our first rodeo with this. We had H1N1. We've had the swine flu. Now, the swine flu, um, we had the bird flu. I remember some of these flus getting coverage, but we never shut down the country. We had significant deaths out of H1N1. As I the numbers, there were 61 million Americans infected with H1N1, over 300,000 hospitalized, and over 12,000 deaths. Now, that didn't raise a ripple. We didn't shut down the country because of that. I know what the global figures were on it, but we weren't the only co uh, country that suffered with H1N1. We have had pandemics before, but what we've never had is this massive news coverage over a pandemic. Yeah, I was kind of surprised because I started paying attention to it around the end of January. And um, I, I was shocked that the media didn't pick up on it. Because we know how they love to report hurricanes and winter storms and f fires and anything that can just keep people glued to the television, keep everybody in a panic so they need to watch. So it just it shocked me that they didn't jump on this immediately. But I guess you're right. It was all impeachment all the time. And despite what Nancy Pelosi re said repeatedly, they can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Well, and, and not only that. They won't want to refer back then because the little bit of attention that they did pay to it was to knock President Trump for imposing a travel ban on China back then. Yeah. 
And these yeah. guys were basically trying to call him a racist for doing it. Okay, so they're what they did pay attention to that part of it, but they can't go back and say, "Oh yeah, well we paid attention for knocking the president for trying to take action actions to stem it." And you remember two what, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, they. Uh, the media went nuts because a couple senators, and they only talked about the Republican ones, of course, had sold stock after they had a brief from the intelligence. Yes, the four senators. About this. Right. Yes. And the only one I remember, we'll talk, Diane Feinstein, right? And then I think Richard Burr, and then I don't know the others. You had but, in Georgia, the new election, I elected Kelly Loff, whatever her name is, down in Georgia. She's one of the ones. That kind of, and, and I'm surprised about her. I, I'm sadly surprised because I've been touting uh, the fact that I think this party needs to expand and and have a lot more women and, of course, minorities in the uh, in the talent pool. And so it was a little bit disappointing to see that she did some of these others have done. But by the way. Um, Nancy Pelosi made a fortune, she and her husband, on some of the social media buys that they did around the same time, too. And no one is looking at her sideways about it. So I wonder if we were to go through every politician's portfolio, whether we would find that there's a lot of what appears to be insider trading on knowledge that they have that the rest of the country is either not paying attention to or doesn't have access to. I'm, I'm sure we would find that without a doubt. The, the reason I raise it is because that briefing that supposedly sparked all of them to sell off their stocks happened on January 24th, I believe. So that tells me yeah. that Pelosi had to have been briefed too. She's the Speaker of the House. She's third in line. You mean to tell me that the intelligence community didn't let her know what was going on? Oh, absolutely they did. And you know that they did. So I am I'm absolutely sure that she knew. And and most of them, look, these 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 guys know what was going on there. And they some of them benefited from it personally. And we will never find out the full extent that that took place. James, I mean, you guys have been the target of dishonest media coverage really since when <laughs> Rush went national. Uh, so I know you're not surprised by the media's behavior when it comes to, to covering Trump. But just in the last month, you had Chuck Todd scolding the vice president of the United States for the, the Trump administration, suggesting that Democrats may be politicizing this. And then not a month later, Chuck Todd is asking uh, former Vice President Joe Biden, if if Trump has blood on his hands for all of of this, uh, have have you been surprised at s some of the lows uh, you've been seeing from the mainstream media when it comes to their coverage? No, nope, not at all. I am I am not surprised. I continue to be very disappointed, but not surprised at the way that they handle this. It's clear. I mean, every day when you look at the Amazon Prime Washington Post or the New York Times or um, some of the other mainstream outlets, the Trump hate has been their agenda since before he took office. Every day, almost every column of album is dripping with Trump hate. And it's not, it hasn't stopped no matter what the news story is. They find an angle to bash this president with. This is the president, in their view, that can do nothing right. Everything that he does is not just wrong policy, but has some evil underlying motivation behind it. These people have exposed themselves as hyper-partisan beyond belief. There is no more real journalism on the left. 
you you will find a random story here or there that's a good journalistic piece, but when you look at the commentary, it, it's just total Trump hate. If, if you look at most of the news stories, anyone that reads it objectively can see the bias that these people have and the deep hatred that they have for this president. Well, there's going to have to be a lot of mental gymnastics involved into propping up Joe Biden throughout this presidential race. Uh, what do you make of him as a threat for Trump's reelection? Well, their only hope is to try to re-energize the Obama coalition. And <clears throat> I think some of the corona coverage, by the way, is headed in that direction right now. Over the last two days, you've seen the um, stories that say, okay, black Americans are getting hit worse by corona. Well, okay, if that's factual, that's factual. But then what's the next story that comes after that? It's going to be how this administration is not doing anything to help these black people and Hispanic people and minorities. It's going to be how discriminatory the um, the the stimulus has been awarded to people. It's going to be to find the biggest sob stories that they can find surround some sort of racial um, uh, uh, racial animus that is directed at, at, at members of those communities from the administration. You can see where this is going right now. And so I think the administration had better be, the, the, the campaign had better be aware of that and address it quickly. And I think that without now having the economy to run on, this administration had be, has to be very careful about how they avoid the traps that the Democrats are trying to lay for them. I'm not so much Joe Biden. I mean, I almost feel sorry for Joe Biden. He's he's. It is obvious that Joe Biden is nowhere near the man that he was in terms of his mental capacity right now. It's obvious that he slowed down. It's obvious that he's that he's having some cognitive issues right now. So I don't think he is as big a threat as coordinated media and his campaign and the Democrat Party are when it comes to advancing an anti-Trump narrative. I think that's where the danger is. And now you started your own PAC, right, to kind of help with this effort? Or am I, am I, I did. that incorrectly? You want to tell yes, me what yes, that's yes. It's about? Called New, thank you for asking. New Journey PAC. NewJourneyPack.org is where people can find us. And that's why we did form it, to actually battle back on some of these racial narratives that we knew were coming. And so we will be addressing some of this stuff that's going on now with corona. But we have some longer-term goals. What we wanted to do and what I wanted to do, and I've assembled a great crew that's working with me on this, very distinguished people, very hardworking and, and bright people. What we want to do is actually, in the long term, um, engagement centers in every single blue city in America, major blue city, where we can um, go into neighborhoods and actually demonstrate who conservatives are, that we are not these evil monsters that we've been portrayed at, that we, in fact, are good neighbors that want to help these communities that need help and have not been getting it for 50 years from the party that they think is operating in their best interest. But we're not going in looking for votes. What we're going in is looking to change the narrative about who conservatives are, what is it that we want for the American people, including African Americans and Hispanics. What do we want? We want African Americans to share in the American dream, and we want to help a system, assist people in these communities to get there. This is their birthright as American citizens, and the fact that all these years after the Civil Rights Movement, we're still talking about some of the same issues. We're still talking about why 
black parents can't send their children to the school that they want to send them to. I mean, think about that. You can go into a supermarket. You can buy whichever brand of toilet paper you want if it's on the shelf. You can buy whatever hand sanitizer you want if it's on the shelf. You can buy whatever brand of food that you want. You can go get a the person how you want your hair cut. But on the most, one of the most influential decisions that you will ever make, what school do I want to send my child to? The Democrat Party proudly stands up and say, you don't have a right to choose this. We are going to choose it for you. And it's just wrong. And then you look at these failing schools in almost every neighborhood where there's a large presence of African Americans or Hispanics. First of all, most of these white politicians like Elizabeth Warren would never send their kids to these kind of schools where there's a threat of physical violence every day, where they're going to come out of these schools after 12 years um, without the proper education they need, not only to advance into college, but to have a decent chance of advancing in society. They wouldn't send their kids to these schools, but they're demanding black people continue to send their kids to these failing schools so that they can support teachers' unions. So we're going to go in these neighborhoods, and we are going to agitate for change. But we're going to advocate, um, <clears throat> agitate for change to help these communities because they deserve better. You know what I and like about a, oh, sorry, you know what I like about what you're saying, James, is I've heard people on the right for decades talk about how the right should try to court the black vote, and it seems like 95 of the percent of the messaging coming from the right is just social conservatism and it, it hasn't really worked the, the, uh, you know as as far as you know Christian conservatives and and I'm not knocking them uh, but really it, it seems like what would be a more effective argument is pocketbook Pocket issues book. and education issues you know and here's here's something that is not widely known this happened in Florida a few years back, in the 2016 cycle, Andrew Gillum and the teachers' unions here promised that if Gillum were elected, one of the first things that they would do is strip the school choice initiative in this state away, roll it back. 10,000, almost all black or Hispanic parents showed up in Tallahassee. This was the largest civil rights demonstration in the state's history to demand that these, this school choice initiative in Florida be sustained. It wasn't reported. The, the margin of votes that propelled Governor DeSantis into victory were black females who were voting on school choice as the issue. They did not want to have their choice taken away by Andrew Gillum and the Democrats. And that was Ron DeSantis' margin of victory in the state of Florida. This is not only a good moral issue, because it is. It's not only a great civil rights issue, because it is. It's a good political issue to run on. And the Republican Party has done a dismal job, in my view, of actually messaging to black parents on a very basic issue of freedom. Yeah. So have, have you decided what city you're going to launch in first? We were looking right before um, uh, the this coronavirus took place. We were looking at... Um, opening an engagement center in Dallas, number one, because we have to keep Texas red. But then looking at the battleground states in Philadelphia, we are looking in Detroit, and we're trying to decide which ones we were going to go to first. It was either going to be Dallas, Detroit, or Philadelphia first, but then we're going to spread out from there. 
Just Let me just be really clear. I mean, you guys are friends. I'll be honest with you. One of the things that I run into, that we've run into with this is, oh, yeah, we gave to Candace. Now, I have <laughs> I was nothing to bring against- her up. I was going to say, is this a Candace Owens thing? Is she involved with this? But I didn't know if you wanted no, to go she's there. Not. No, she's not. Be- but, and, and I love Candace. And Candace is very, very, extremely influential and very bright. And I have nothing but love for Candace Owens. But we're working kind of on two different but complementary tracks. We're trying to move votes, and we're also trying to be in the community in a very different way than she's, than she's doing. But the message that we get back is kind of like, oh, yeah, we did that black thing with Candace, so, you know, never mind. But is that doing? a message that's coming um, from that's white, okay. white boomers, James? Is What's that white that? boomers who are saying that to you? Because that's yeah, yeah. the core audience that I'm surrounded by. It's like my dad and his friends. Oh, did you see the new Candace video? I'm like, oh, no. Yeah. She's really yeah, moving exactly. the with the, the, the boomer set, the old white guys. They like her. Yeah, and I applaud Candace for being so yeah. out there that everyone, she's become a household name. And, uh, <laughs> again, I have nothing but love for Candace Owens. And I have nothing but love for the three wise men. And we talk about them, too. You know, black conservatives are standing on the shoulders of some giants, Thomas Sowell, Walter Williams, and Shelby Steele, the three wise men are what we call them. They're amazing. But we have now four generations of black conservatives. You have the three wise men and their generation, and there were more than that, obviously, but those are the three that are most known. You have Robert Woodson. You have all those guys from, the, from, from that end. Then you have my generation of black conservatives, Younger than me, you have people in like Audrey Pruitt, who's the guy that's running New Journey day to day, and there's a whole other generation of guys uh, and gals in in that age group, and then you've got the younger set like Candace Owens. So this has become it is we are witnessing the beginning of a movement in this country that has been growing very slowly from the 1960s and is taking this long to. Start to take a hold. Right now, that movement is beginning, and it is. Uh, it, I think. Oh, thanks, Tony. After fifty years, it is going to grow into a force that will not only change American politics but also change American culture, because a lot of the cultural issues that are happening in black communities we're not allowed to talk about. You know, you're not allowed to talk about how. An, an entire culture changed from being one that glorified education to now kind of in a way disparaging it, where all of a sudden uh, it's okay. You have cultural uh, heroes in, in, for some people saying that it's okay to speak ebonically, to not learn the English language. You have a culture of violence that took place in the music and misogyny. We, you know, you, we talked about that when it was when rap music was was new. But now you're looking at rap music being three, 30 years ingrained into the American psyche. And so, what is it actually? Not just rap music, but what is black music talking about? Uh, you have a culture where, in the 1950s, <clears throat> black families where it was common to have two-parent families. In fact, there were more two-parent black families than any other racial group in America. Now, it's the complete reverse. In the 1950s, early 60s, the number of black people getting abortions were the least in America. Now, black women have more abortions than anyone else in America. And I'm not here to, to, to stand in judgment over black women and to judge and to their choices, but something very dysfunctional has happened within black communities. And so one of the things that we want to do long term is also affect the culture, because American culture cannot advance healthy until all of the subcultures in America also are healthy. We can't have um, a culture that is anywhere from 13 to 20 percent of of American population be dysfunctional and at the same time have a non-dysfunctional American culture. It just doesn't work like that. 
James, how do you feel that uh, the Democratic Party's much more radical stance on the Second Amendment and gun control uh, has had an impact on African Americans voters, uh, African American voters' thoughts uh, and impressions of the of the Democratic Party, and is it causing them to take a second look at maybe moving away as well? I tell you what, I had an interesting conversation a few weeks ago with Isaiah Washington, and Isaiah is a total Second Amendment guy. And he's not the only one. There are a lot more black people now that are actually talking about Second Amendment. You didn't hear a lot of that talk before. What you did have was a generation of black folks that understood that they had better protect their right to to have guns back in my mother's generation and my father's generation because they needed those guns to protect themselves and their families from the the Democrat Party's militia, which was the Ku Klux Klan, um, which is the Ku Klux Klan. So back then, black people, in, in, especially in rural areas, instinctively understood they needed a Second Amendment. My granddad had guns. I got my ass whipped for <laughs> fooling around with one of my... Uh, because just being stupid. I pulled it off and I pointed it at my cousin and I got my ass kicked because it was like, you little city idiot. You don't even know. You're not supposed to do that. Um, I was down in Alabama during the summer, during that time I was a kid. And I, you know, I I had never been around guns. I saw them on TV, so I pulled it up and I was playing with it. Okay. But we instinctively understood back then that the Second Amendment was vital for us. And I think now that is emerging again. And I will say this, the the gangsters and the, the street conscious crowd that are using guns illegally, that's a whole other side of the culture that has to be actually eradicated, where you have kids with no knowledge of, of, where you have kids with very little consciousness running around with guns, and there's no value for human life or for the impact of having firearms. So that is also something that has to be addressed. But that is not a Second Amendment issue. That is an issue of how the laws are being enforced. But as a Second Amendment issue, I think it's going to continue to grow in black communities across the country. All right. And you mentioned Isaiah Washington. For everybody that doesn't know, he was he's an actor. And what was he on? Um, what's that? Grey's Anatomy. Grey's Anatomy. But didn't he get booted off there for saying violating PC rules years ago? Yep. yep. He was one of the first that got hit with the whole PC thing because he made a statement that some, that, that got him in trouble with uh, a certain group of people. And um, But he's, a, he's had a, a brilliant career afterwards as a director. He's working on a few movies. He's, um, he's a very, very bright and engaging guy. So he's, he's had a future beyond that. And is he going to be working with you on this project? We're talking about working together on a few things. All right, all a little right. premature to say which ones, but we're talking. Well, I mean, he's been giving James Woods a run for his money for the most vocal, but you know, out there right winger on Twitter from the Hollywood set. Oh yeah, oh yeah, he is. He's he's yeah. he's, he's he's totally in the game. I, I kind of love that. Do you, do you credit Trump for a lot of this? I mean, I know it's it's the left dismisses this idea that Trump's made any inroads in the uh, quote unquote black community, but I, I, from where I say he just... seems to have. But I'm just curious what you've what you you've seen out there. Here's what I saw as recently as yesterday. I talked to one of my godsons yesterday. The last time I talked to him. He was a total Obama kind of, you know, politically thinking guy. I spoke with him yesterday, 
And he said, you know, one of the things he told me was, I used to think that you were crazy. He, and long, long story short, he said, I will never vote for the Democrats again. I have seen now with my own eyes what they have done to our community. And he said, and I had checked out Trump before he was president. And I see the kind of way that they're handling him now, just calling him a racist. In fact, that is not what he is. And I was stunned. Now, this is a guy that he will probably be 40 in, you know, the next three or four years. He's in his mid-30s. Um, and I was shocked. Yeah. Because this guy was a diehard liberal. And so if that can happen to him, I just wonder if that is something that is happening in many other parts of the country. I don't know it to be true, but I'm thinking it may be. And was there an inciting incident, some aha moment for him? I don't know. And that's when we're going to I'm going to be talking with him further. I I was just like getting out of the way and letting this conversation roll. I wasn't trying to you know, dig into it. I was just like, whoa, this is in, this is incredible. And he just said now when he runs into other people, he, and what he what he did tell me is that his stance now has caused a family rift uh, with other members of the family. And I'm just like, well, hey, welcome, welcome. That's what uh, when you when you finally turn away from being a Democrat, that's all part of the picture. Yeah. Do you think that you're going to see this more and more uh, this phenomenon of, of people who are closeted uh, right wingers in the black community? I think so. I think it is growing. And that's where I think Candace is doing a lot of great work with the younger set. I think just because she's out there and she's so engaging, I think that there are a whole bunch of young folks um, that are just if if they're not if they're not totally flipping the switch, they're at least questioning because they they see that she's intelligent, they see that she's got some points of view that they can agree with, and I think that 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 she's starting to open up a lot. Uh, um, that she's having a dialogue with a lot of people that is starting a younger set, and I mean by that people in their late teens through their thirties of questioning their own beliefs. So I think that may happen, and she's not the only one. There are a lot of others that are happening that are out there. They're speaking, but Can Candace is the most visible. She's made herself kind of a national spokesperson for the idea of change and i think that's great i think she's having a big impact i guess we'll we'll see in november i mean i, I think biden's gonna have a hard time if do, so far obama really hasn't come out and supported him maybe he will now that bernie's finally completely out of the way and this is pretty much a done deal although of course he's gonna stay on the ballots and keep the donations rolling in until the last possible second but I mean, I, I I haven't heard from you, but I've heard from Rush, and I would imagine if you disagreed, I would have heard a little back and forth on the show that Obama's been MIA through this whole thing, and it's been kind of weird. Do you think now he'll come out and start, you got to vote for my buddy Joe? I don't know. I think that Obama and Michelle are enjoying the good life. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he wants to get kind of tainted in the back and forth of daily politics anymore. I think they want to become and be what they are, kind of international celebrities, and be adored, and not get in the muck and mire of, of the political grind anymore. Look, Obama and Michelle are kind of like black bourgeoisie elitists. They always have been, and I don't, I don't say that pejoratively. I mean, there's a whole culture in black communities of black elitists, who are just like the white elitist counterparts, who, who've done well for themselves, and yeah, they have their, their their political views and all of that, but they are about the good life. And I think if you look at Michelle and you look at, at at Barack Obama, I think they represent the black bourgeoisie very well. They're part of the good life. They're part of the black intelligentsia. They're part of the international black intelligentsia. They they 
They can travel in, in the circles of the elite. They've made a bucket load of money. Yeah. And they're enjoying the good life. Yeah. So I don't know what they want to get bothered with the money. And, you know, Michelle made no secret that she hated the grind of American politics. And so right, all that's the why time I was like, confused that, that people kept saying, oh, she's going to run. She's going to run. I, and I said all the time, she's never going to run. She hates it. And she's been really clear that she hates it. And I take her at a word. I think she hates it. I think she'd much rather travel around, hang out with Beyonce and Jay Z, hang out with the with whoever the big fashion divas are in Europe, hang around with the Oprah. Well, I don't know whether she had Oprah get along or not, or I, I don't know. But I my impression of Michelle Obama has been that she's a good mother, that she cares about her family, that she likes the good life, and she's enjoying it. And please. She, and, and she cares. I'm not saying that she doesn't care about people and cares or care about other issues, but that isn't the driving force of her life. Social change, I don't think, is the driving force of her life. And by the way, that's okay. Right, right. I don't, no, I I don't think that, that she, I think, we, I think people try to project onto her what they wanted her to be instead of who she was. I want to walk you through something, James, and see uh, if you think I'm on to something. Let's pretend for a second that there will be a Democratic National Convention in Milwaukee and the coronavirus doesn't uh, throw a wrench in all that. I can see Barack Obama going up there and giving a speech and pulling a total AOC when it came to campaigning for Bernie Sanders, giving a 30-minute speech and basically saying, me, 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 I, 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 and maybe not even mentioning Joe Biden's name once. Do you see that happening? I think Obama's too smart for that. <clears throat> I think what Obama would do uh-huh. is give an, an, an inspirational speech that doesn't reflect the way that he governed. I think he would give Joe a wholehearted endorsement. You know, he was by my side. Now you need to be by his side kind of thing, blah, blah, blah. Um, And I think he would kind of highlight to the fact that we all have to be one people. We all have to have hope and change. We all have to go for the big. He'll try to defend his legacy as being on top of things when it came to climate change. I think he would take indirect swipes at President Trump without doing a few frontal. And he'd talk about the need for us to rise above Trumpism as a nation and kind of give Joe a, yeah, well, this is the best of the litter. Because Obama knows that all of his people are going to be under in the Biden administration. If there were to be one, they would be staffed with his people and try to reclaim part of his legacy. But I don't think he would be so attached to his ego that he wouldn't mention Joe or that he would give Joe kind of a short shrift. I think he would try to position himself as the healer, the big vision guy. Um, and, and, yeah, you got to vote for Joe. And Joe stuck with me. And, yeah, I've done my thing. And now let me go back to enjoy the good life. Well, I guess we'll have to see, huh? I guess. We should take bets on this. Yeah, we should, and then come back and just and, and actually figure out who was right in this. And I'd love for fingers to be right because it would be. So fun, by the way. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, before we turn the page on Bernie Sanders completely, what's your gut telling you? Do you think he was bought off by the DNC? Was he threatened by the DNC or both? <laughs> Neither. I think he looked at the numbers and knows that he couldn't win. And the more of this coronavirus came, um, if he dragged this thing out during the coronavirus, he would be blamed for a Biden loss. I think it was total self-interest. He said, ah, we can't win. Let's just get out of this right now. Um, Joe, I think that Bernie Sanders, uh, you know, he, I don't think the guy ever really wanted to be president. I no, think he wanted to get his ideas out. I think he wanted to make money and get attention. I agree with you. Because he wasn't willing to I fight think... for it, and it was really kind of pathetic to watch. Right. Right. 
And I, I, I don't think he ever wanted to be president. So I, 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 didn't, I don't think that any of them thought it would be Joe Biden. I thought all of them thought it would be someone lower in the ranks, like Elizabeth or, or, or um, before she flamed out so beautifully, Kamala, which was yeah. a total train wreck, <laughs> full of so much love. You know, I will forever be grateful for Tulsi Gabbard taking her down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And by the way, Tulsi Gabbard, to me, I wish she was on our side. Yeah, I do, too. She's actually a fighter that's willing to stand up for what she believes in. She stood up to the DNC back in 2016 when all the, the emails came out and you found out what was going on behind the scenes. And she quit. And she stood by Bernie yeah. Sanders. And he had no loyalty to her. When Hillary's out there calling her a Russian agent, he can't be bothered to speak up and denounce that or, you know, push back against it. God forbid we upset Hillary. Yep. Yeah, I like Tulsi Gabbard for a Democrat. I wish that, as I said, I wish that she would, on policy, I wish she'd kind of come over to our side. And I wish politically that she would actually be on our side because I think she would be, I, I tell you, I think she has a lot of integrity and she has a lot of character. Mm-hmm. I agree. And that, that's why she'll never make it in that party. <laughs> exactly. Um, Spartacus <laughs> never had a chance. Um, <laughs> but do you think do you think he ends up in a potential VP? I know there's this whole push. We've got to have a woman. So now we're talking about what's that? The chick that looks like she's the, the Michigan the, governor. Yeah, she looks like uh, Carol from Tiger King's best friend. I've seen her in leopard print. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, they're boy. talking about her and then the uh, should have been governor of Georgia, <laughs> Stacey Abrams. Which You're is kidding, Stacey <laughs> Adams, please. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I don't Stacey. know. I thought Cory Booker kind of sucked up a little bit. I was wondering if he was angling for it, some sort of position in a Biden Spartacus, position. Spart- Spartacus is done. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's going to, Spartacus would be lucky if he holds on to his Senate seat. If he gets a strong challenger, he may be just done in the Senate. But, um, yeah, I don't think so. I, I think that uh, it, I think it, it's going to be probably the woman out of Michigan for Biden. It can't be Elizabeth Warren. Too mm-hmm. radical. It can't be Kamala. You know, Kamala totally train wrecked. You know, she and Biden were friends before she went on the attack. And yeah. she did herself in. Not only did she lose any chance of ever becoming president, she totally killed off her chances of being vice president. I agree. She was, friends with, uh, she was good friends with yeah. Bo Biden, right? She was friends with Hunter and with the other one. Yeah, Bo, the one that was actually the, the non-degenerate. Bo that Biden. That's who she was really good friends with. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you. I've been saying for weeks I think it's going to be Gretchen Whitmer because the Democrats need Michigan, and yep. she's fairly popular in the state. I've My dad lives up in Michigan. I'm from Michigan originally, and uh, you know my dad's conservative, but he doesn't have a negative opinion of Whitmer so far. So I, I think that that would be a logical pick. She you know she hits the check mark. You've got a, a woman on the ticket. Uh, it's one of the check marks that needs to be on the list. So I, I think it's a logical choice. I think it's actually simpler than that. She's a looker. <laughs> yeah, but it, she's really in like Julia Roberts, the beginning of Pretty Woman. Right. She's a looker. And I think that's enough. She's a looker. Hey, look at her. We got a Democrat woman that looks great. Oh, yeah, she can talk and she's a governor. You know, yeah, well, I really a lot of this hinges James on facts, it can't be on policy because have you heard her policies? No, I, I the only she policy just, I heard of hers was she was trying to stop doctors from over prescribing hydroxychloroquine. Right. And she talks in platitudes. That's all she does. Well, that's easy but enough. She's a looker. Yeah, she's a looker. So it'll be fine. Well, you've you've been in radio for decades, James. Uh, have you had a chance yet to hear the inaugural episode of "Here's the Deal" by Joe Biden, his new podcast? 
No, I've been spared. <laughs> <laughs> That's not homework for you? I, no, I, I can just read about that. I don't have to force myself. In the, you, you're right. I've been in radio a long time. I know now when I have to torture myself and when I don't. <laughs> I can read about that and save myself the torture. <laughs> I just think it's an interesting idea. And, and because here you've got a guy who you just talked about earlier. You're not sure if he's all there anymore. He's not maybe an effective messenger for his party. And, you know, you, you've got a challenging time. You're trying to campaign. Uh, in 2020 and you, you really have a difficult time doing that because you can't go around the country and and uh shake hands and sniff people's hair so you've got to be able to uh you know, get your message out there so he launches this podcast and i listened to the first episode and you know the claiming that he's trying to be a calm voice in in these troubling times but it's almost like he's trying to do some sort of weird larry king style interview show where he knows that he's not an effective messenger, so he's just asking someone else questions and having them step up and kind of talk about his agenda. It's it's really a, a weird strategy, James. Well, there's Joe Biden. I'm telling you, this guy's not all there. Look, it took them four days to figure out how to do streaming medium. Streaming <laughs> media. It took them four days to set up his basement setup goodness go buy a macbook pro open up facetime and go online go to skype go to zoom and get hacked (laughs) how four days yeah which by the way the next time we do this we will do video i can't stand the way i look on video right now in my home office so I'm going to get the lighting done properly and do all of that. So the next time we do this, we can do a video one. I know. I was going to give you shit about that, James. I don't know if you've seen what any of the late night hosts have been reduced to. Yeah, but I can't. But I got to like the way you it, look. You have when, when you're old and you don't look good anymore, you at least have to like something of the way that you look. That's fair enough. But you also have production standards that you want to uphold. So you're not going to yeah. sit there and, and talk into your MacBooks, you know, the inboard microphone on that, like they're all doing. Right. So I'm going to get it set up to do it right. All right. Is it going to take you more than four days? It'll probably take me. I already have some of the stuff. It'll take me just a day or two to get the lighting straight because I'm going to actually consult with someone that knows about this since I don't. But then to implement it, no, it won't take four days. I could do the streaming now. In fact, I can get my nephew to do the streaming. In fact, I can get my nephew's 18-month-old to do the streaming. (laughs) Well, maybe you should let the Biden campaign know that you've got an 18-month-old who's willing to work. Yeah. (laughs) So, guys, it's been an hour. Yeah, I know. We got a couple questions that we had our audience that wanted to know some things that are really big and important to them. Okay. For example, my mother wants to know. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> She's been bugging me to ask you this for a couple of years, so I figured why not do it so everybody can hear the answer. So I gifted her maybe four or five years ago with a subscription to Rush 24-7. Yeah. Because she's the reason that I grew up listening to you guys and would count myself among the Rush babies. And so in the past, when she would listen live, you would play the old Paul Shanklin tunes, the parody yeah. songs. But now there's yeah. some jazz track that plays. And I kid yeah. you not, James, at least no- once a month I get a note. I from- have nothing to do with why. it. I don't know the answer to it. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Mamone runs that. You'll have to talk with Mike. Look, when I'm working remotely, I listen to the same the same two jazz tunes you're talking about <laughs> over and over and over again. Okay. And I've asked the question, and I get back, none of your business. So it's like, okay. Oh. Maybe somebody's making a pretty penny off that. Is somebody getting syndication money? Oh, no. No, it has something to do with some 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 legal something. And I'm not sure what it is, 
and I've never really investigated because it's really not my business. Right. But it, uh, my mother will feel better knowing that it annoys you, too. It annoys me. Well, we got a question from Brady. Uh, how did you meet Rush, and were you politically conservative at the time? I met Rush's first date in New York when he was walking into 1330 ABC for the first time, the ABC building. I happened to be out there. I met him his first day in New York. I didn't work on his show until much later. Um, uh, well, not much later, until some time later. And um, was I politically conservative? Yes, but I didn't self-identify as a conservative probably until um, maybe a year or two before I met Rush. Wow. So he didn't convert you. You were already there. I was a conservative already. Wow. And then I just want to know, how are you guys all holding up there considering what's going on with Rush right now? It was devastating when we first heard the news. Right now, we are all very optimistic, and we are holding up very well. And I tell you what, knowing what he's going through gives us a deeper appreciation for every single day he's there with us. Yeah, he's been sounding great the last week. So Yep. I know. Yep. Got tons of people praying for him and hoping he makes it through this. So I'm sure that helps. Absolutely. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much, James. We'll have to have you back as soon as you get that 18-month-old uh, to set up your studio for you. Yep, we will do that. And I'm, I am going to do that. So we'll have to do a video of one of these really soon. I enjoy this one because you guys are friends, and I feel like I can be totally candid and, and not try to have to worry about being suckered, you know, sucker punched or anything. So I really enjoy this. Well, thank you. We enjoy thank having you. you. Missed you. Missed you, too. Okay, we'll do it soon. Okay, thanks, James. Right. Thanks, James. Take care. All right. All right, you too. Bye-bye.